Starting now, I will reject complacency and embrace the greatness that God has planted inside of me. I will waste no opportunity to glorify God through the heavenly gifts he has entrusted to me. I will be courageous. I will give no place to fear or failure. I will answer the call. I will not procrastinate my progress. I will not sacrifice my calling for my comfort. I will not waver when I am weak, nor will I cower. I will be courageous. I'm not too old, nor am I too young to fulfill your call. I'm ready to obey every instruction you have given me. I will not turn left or right from them, and I will study your word continually and meditate on it day and night. I will be courageous. I will be courageous. The Christian life isn't a playground, it's a battleground. And even if I lose the battle, I will win the war because I know you will not fail or abandon me. I will not fear the enemy or be stopped by discouragement for the Lord, my God, my strength, my healer, my provider, my savior, the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below goes before me. And if he goes before me, then I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, neither height, nor depth, or anything else in all of creation can come against me. I will answer the call. I will follow your command. I will go wherever you send me. I will be strong and courageous. Good morning, River of Life. It is great to be with you again. We are excited. We are motivated. We are ready to continue our series on Courageous. We are looking at the life of Joshua and we are on chapter four. Before we dive in, I kind of want to give an overset of what I am thinking about because this chapter is dealing with memorials. And as I've pondered that, I think of all the great things that I can allow my mind to go to regarding where the Lord has taken us and this church over the last five years. Because each year has been a memorial where we can refresh, when we, where we can go back and say, wow, look what God did here. Look what God did there. Now we are going to open that up a little bit more as we talk about it. But in 2017, if you have been with us, our theme was Ignite for the Year. We went through the book of Acts and we began to see how Christianity began to get its root through the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit did as he gave boldness and and he began to show the disciples as they spoke out as they saw signs and wonders and it was a phenomenal year as we prayed God ignite our hearts to who you are give us that passion of the spirit we went into 2018 and talked about being fearless and what that meant as God was stirring our hearts. In 2019, our theme was rescued. Again, a memorial to go back and look at all the things that God showed us through his word. As he told us, listen, not only do the lost people who have never accepted me as savior need rescuing, but people that you are sitting next to into church in church people in our families our co-workers need rescuing as as things happen in our lives whether it's it's depression anxiety fear loneliness all these kinds of things we walk through in 2020 it was a year where we didn't have an initial theme but but we began to break down some things that the Holy Spirit was putting on our hearts at our church and we talked about what 
does love have to do with it? And we talked about loving people. We looked at 1 Corinthians 13. We moved on to the book of James and talked about, hey, it's time to grow up. And that was a great memorial. It was a great series. We looked at eternal life matters. It matters because we are all going to spend eternity somewhere. We all are going to live forever. It's just a matter of where. In the presence of God in heaven or without him in hell. And then we took some time to talk about America. And that was a powerful series that, that we walk through. And we move then to a study of the Holy Spirit. And again, these were key moments in the life of our church over the last five years. And now today, in 2021, our theme is Reclaim, and we have talked about reclaiming our prayer life and how important that is. We talked about joy, and we looked at the book of Philippians. We went through the entire book and saw that joy is superior to happiness because happiness comes and goes. It is something that is created by man, by emotion. And joy, on the other hand, is a gift from the Holy Spirit. It is supernatural. We also looked at our destiny as we walk through the life of Joseph. And now we are looking at the life of Joshua and we are talking about courage. So when you just, boy, just me saying that again, so many memories, so many memorials begin to pop up in my mind. And that does give me courage. It gives me strength. It fires me up for what God is going to do in my life, in this church's life. And so this morning, when we come to Joshua chapter four, really the entire chapter deals with a memorial. And so at the outset, I just want to point out to you that God loves memorials. In fact, if you go through the Bible and you look at the men and women whom God used, he has always set up various memorials for them to go back to, for them to get excited about, for that to give them hope and direction. In fact, in Genesis 19, 16, we read that God gave the first memorial and that was a rainbow to Noah and to his family, that God was faithful, that God promised he would never flood the earth again. In Genesis 22, 13, God gave to the Israelites the memorial of circumcision. And it was a memorial of his covenant, his love for the people and for Abraham. In Exodus 3, God gave his name to the Jewish people. And it was a memorial that they could go back to. He, he said, this is the name by which I am to be remembered. You go back to Exodus chapter 12 and God gave the Passover as a memorial. And this is to be a memorial for succeeding generations that you might remember that I delivered you from the Egyptians. According to Numbers 15, the Israelites were to wear little tassels and the four tassels on the edge of their garment. These were a memorial to remind them about God's law, about God's faithfulness. And even in the New Testament, we have memorials when we talk about water baptism, that we are, we are, we are, dead with Christ, but now we live in communion as we remember Jesus' death and his resurrection and his, and his return where he is coming back again. So today I want to talk to you about the importance of you and I making memorials. The importance of memorializing certain events in our lives and what that will do to help us position ourselves to move forward. It is going to position our attention to victory. It is going to help us be courageous in what God wants to do. So when I look at Joshua, what I find so interesting is as the children of Israel are getting ready to enter the promised land, God wants them to remember where they came from. He wants them to look back at all the things that have happened. And church, God doesn't want us to just go forward and forget 
everything that we have learned, everything that is behind us, certainly there is a sense in which we can't live or dwell in the past, but at the same time, it's what God has done in the past that directs us forward, that reminds us who he is and who we are in him. And when that happens, we begin to remember, I am more than a conqueror because I am in Christ Jesus. That's why this is so critical this morning, not only for our church, but for us as individuals. As God is stirring us up, as God is planting things in our hearts that are going to develop over time, that we are going to see come to fruition, to remember what God has done in our hearts and our minds. We create memorials that, that we might recall where we have been so that we might have the courage and the strength to then go where God is leading us. Now, I'm aware that there is a danger sometimes in memorials where we don't want memorials to become idols in our lives. So we are not talking about that. God warned the Israelites in Numbers chapter 21 about that, where for such a time, God had, a, had Moses build this rod with a, with, with, a, with a bronze snake around it. And when the people looked at it, they would be healed, representing the cross and what Jesus was going to do through salvation. And, and, so, and so that was something that God warned them that, hey, this is, this is something that I don't want you to, to worship. And we see other examples throughout the word of God in 2 Kings 18 with Hezekiah. But listen, God wants us to remember what he has done. And there is a reason for that. And I want to share just three of those this morning. The first is this. We have to pray for courage. Why? Because, because they encourage memorials, encourage the present generation. And so we pray for this. Now, as Israel was preparing to cross the Jordan, they were, there would be a number of great difficulties that they were going to come into. We have seen that they were going to face giants in the land. There were, there were armies that were more powerful, more trained than them. Cities were going to see in a couple of weeks. Jericho, which was a fortified city. And it would not be easy, an easy task for them to take this land that was promised by God. In fact, even though God was going before them and leading them, God said to Joshua, Listen, I am not going to let you take it all at once because the land will overrun you. You see, there are some things that are, are very good that God wills for us, but he doesn't give them to us. He doesn't give them to us right at the time that we would like to have them. We want everything right now. We want things instantly. And God says, listen, I know what's best for you and I want the best for you. So you are going to have to trust me and take each step and move forward each time with courage and trust and, and, and faith. And, and sometimes we don't receive those promises without a battle, without a fight. Because God, because God knows that you and I are not really, are, are not ready to possess those things. And so that's how it was for Israel as they crossed the Jordan and began to get ready to take the promised land. In fact, if you read the book of Joshua, you will find that for 30 years, the Israelites fought at the end of that 30 years when Joshua died, they still had not conquered all of the land that was promised. Now, God knew that the people might get discouraged, that it would be difficult, that there would be times where they would feel like quitting, like giving up. And that's the love of God. God cares for us. He knows our hearts. The Bible says that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. So listen, God knows there are times when you and I feel like throwing in the towel. He knows there are times when we are moving forward, when we're striving to be courageous in his plan and the purpose that he has for us, that we would feel like stopping. 
and not moving forward and not taking those steps of, of faith and not going after his presence. So God wants us to have memorials and he wants us to have them for the purpose of encouraging us as we continue to do his will. Look at it in Joshua chapter four and verse eight. It says, and the people of Israel did just as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones out of the midst of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of people of Israel, just as the Lord told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to the place where they lodged them and laid them down there. And Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are there to this day. You go down to Joshua 4.19 and it says the people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho and those 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal. Now when you look at verse 7, this is where God told Joshua to take those stones. It was going to be a memorial for them. Gilgal would be that base of operation. They would go out, attack certain cities, and then they would come back to Gilgal. And Joshua, it's interesting, he sent those, set up those stones there. And the reason why he did that, the reason why he had that memorial was to encourage the people, to give them courage, to give them hope. To remind them because you see, not every day was going to be a good day in the promised land. Not every day was going to be a good day in Canaan. Not every day would be a victory. And on those days when things weren't really going well, on the days when they suffered defeat, when they suffered setbacks, when their emotions got ahead of their convictions, when they were struggling, on the days where, where they would feel like, you know what, is this worth it? Are God's promises true? When they would come back then to Gilgal, they would look at those stones and it would be a reminder of some powerful things. And I shared with you over the last two Sundays that God has impressed upon my heart to, to go to every Wednesday starting in January Every Wednesday we are going to have prayer meetings and we are going to cry out to God and, and I believe it is going to be a time in the middle of the week throughout the years to come where we come back together and we're refreshed, where we come into the presence of God, we acknowledge Him, we cry out to Him, we hear testimonies, we remember what God has done, we begin to pray and lift our voices together. It's going to be a reminder of some powerful things that, that we have seen and that we are going to see. And one of the things that this did was it gave certainty to them of God's direction. They would be reminded of the time God said, I want you to go into the promised land. I want you to take the land and I will be with you. I will be with you. I am going to part the Jordan River. You are going to cross over. So every time they saw those stones, it would remind them of God's hand on their life, that God was directing them, that God didn't forget them. Oh, how we, you know, we, we need that. We need that in our churches. We need that here. We need that around the world. That we are reminded that God is directing us. God is leading us. It's not any other man or woman. It is not any other government, but it is God. And there are times when we are going to, to do God's will moving forward in what he wants us to do. And, and it just doesn't fall right into place. In fact, sometimes we have the idea that we are in the middle, if we are in the middle of God's will, that it will just all be smooth sailing. When, when that is not necessarily true. This morning, you might be suffering some kind of setback, some kind of difficulty. Maybe your emotions are overriding your com convictions. You're making wrong choices, wrong decisions. You're in a bad place. Let me just encourage you. If our hearts are right with God, 
it doesn't necessarily mean that you are having if you are having difficulty, that you and I are out of God's will. We might be right in the center of God's will, but we are in a battle. We are in a struggle. And we have to be courageous. We have to continue to fight. We have to continue to cross over. We have to continue to trust in God. And we need that memorial, that, mo that moment where, where somewhere in our life that we can look back on and say, wow, yes, I remember. I know God is directing me. I know God is in this. I know God is providing for me. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that my God will not forsake me. That he's not going to leave me. That he is going to fight this battle with me. I have not only seen that personally, in my own life, my own family. I mean, I remember when my wife was, was sick and no one knew what it was. The doctors thought she was crazy. They just said, listen, maybe this is phantom pain. Maybe this is something that's in your head. And we saw God's miraculous hand as, as certain people, doctors that, 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 God used to bring her into the hospital where, where they found out what actually was wrong with her. And God touched her and God healed her. And my wife, and she, she from that pain, from that agony, she, she wrote a book about what God did. And even that book for her, for me, for my children, are, is a memorial of God is faithful. God is who he says he is. God is in control. She says in her book that she was laying down and thinking in her mind and saying out loud, God, I don't ever want to feel this way again. But God told her, listen, this is how desperate I need you to be all the time so you remember who I am, Angela, so you will be courageous. So many things, and we view that as a memorial. God has his hand on this church. I, I said that I believe that. I even look back to my personal life when I was a youth pastor here and, and I, I felt the Lord stirring in my heart as Pastor Bosman, he felt, you know what? The, the time that God gave him here was up and he was moving on. Nothing was wrong. He did what he was supposed to do. He planted the church. And, and I remember in my, in my mind being fearful of, of, do I take this step of faith? God, I know you said this, but I'm, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm, I'm worried. And God was right there. And, and when I took that step, God led me to the right people who encouraged me, who strengthened me. And here we are 27 years later and, and the church is prospering and it's a memorial. There's a, there's a second way memorials encourage us where they fire us up regarding the consistency of God's provision. I mean, every time they would see those stones, they would realize how God provided for them. They would go back in their minds and they would pull up miracles of, of God providing them with manna, God providing them with quail, with water, with clothing, with their sandals. You know, their clothing never wore out. Can you imagine that? Never wore out. It re they re were reminded of the battles of God's faithfulness. And again, I look back in terms of this church and how God has provided for us. I mean, it has been amazing. Even in 2020, when, when things were changing in a heartbeat and, 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 and the dynamics of church changed and we wondered, would we be able to pay our staff? Would we be able to pay our missionaries? Would we be able to pay our mortgage? And you know what? We never missed a beat because God's people were faithful. God was faithful. And, and it was a, it was a remor memorial. I, I think of the land, the extra eight acres that we were able to purchase years and years ago that we paid 2500 for. It was a miracle. It was God's provision. So every day when we look and I look at this building, I think about the consistency of God's help, of his provision, of who he is. And I believe memorials do that for us. There's a third way memorials encourage us. They challenge us regarding God's plan. Every, every, every time Israel saw again those stones, they knew that God had a purpose. 
They knew that God was in control. They knew that God had a plan to conquer the land. They, they, they knew it. They believed it. They saw it. And it was, it was an encouragement to them. It gave them courage. Listen, if I can just say it again, I'm not trying to overdo the parallel, but I believe God is leading us through this study at just the right time for such a time as this. God is moving us forward to be courageous. He is, he is, he is guiding this church and he is using this church, I believe, in a supernatural way. I mean, to worship him unashamed, to be unashamed in our worship. We are, we, are, we are going to continue to discover who God is, what he is all about. I believe he's developing us through life groups, through small groups, and, and preaching the word. When that goes out on Sunday morning, I believe it's not just going to fall on deaf ears, but we are going to receive it and then act upon it in our communities, in our families, around the world. I believe God is waking us up. He is deploying us. He's sending us out to evangelize the lost, to, to understand the presence of God and carry that with us. If God has provided for you in the past, realize that he has a purpose for you in the future and he has a purpose for you right now, today. So memorials are encouragement. We have to pray for them because they give us courage. Secondly, not only do we have to pray for courage, but we fight for courage. Why? Because God gives memorials and they educate the future generation. I mean, memorials educate those who are coming behind us. And we are crossing over. We talked about that last week. Change happens when we're in the presence of God. Watch what happens in verse 6. It says that this may be a sign to you. Speaking of the memorial, of the, the stones that were erected. When your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it passed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. You go down to verse 21 of Joshua 4 and he said to the people, when your children ask their fathers in time to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know Israel passed over the this Jordan on dry ground. So the Lord knows that spiritual heritage can be difficult to pass on to the next generation. I mean, the fact that one generation is serving the Lord does not mean that the next generation will serve him. And this is, this is very, very important. The fact that you as a parent are serving the Lord or that I'm serving the Lord doesn't necessarily mean that our children will automatically, through osmosis, serve the Lord. I mean, they can forget about God. They can lose sight and they can lose their perspective. That is why we need memorials as adults to pass on to the next generation, to show them what God has done in our lives. Whether you're a parent, you're a grandparent, you're an aunt or an uncle, you're a friend. I mean, you, listen, parents, this is true. Memorials are critical and you are the greatest memorial that they have. Parents, it's our job to educate the next generation. Don't, don't wait for your children to choose God. I mean, to choose Christ. We, many times, parents, I hear people say, well, you know, I came to God when I was 30 or 40. And, and that, that is great. That, that is wonderful. And, and the mentality that I hear is, well, at the right time, they'll choose um, God or not. They'll choose salvation or not. No, we must show them. It's not just going to happen. We must teach them. We must train them. The Bible says when they are young. 
Because don't think that they will just learn how to pray. Don't think that they will just have a passion for people who don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Don't think that they're just automatically going to want to study the truths of God or appreciate the Word of God. They're not just going to automatically become worshipers. We must educate the next generation. Again, it just doesn't happen. Salvation doesn't happen through osmosis. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 9, excuse me, verse 5, it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your might. Now we know that and we quote that and we take that verse right out, but I want you to listen to it as a whole in context. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Watch this. You shall teach them diligently to your children and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorsteps, excuse me, doorpost of your house and on your gates. Why is that there? Why do we see it in Joshua? Why do we see it again in the New Testament? It is because God knows you and I, people, can forget. So he is saying, as a, as a parent, be sure you impress on your children the commands of the Lord. Make sure that you teach your children God's grace, God's mercy, God's love, who he is. I mean, because in one generation, there can be a massive change. I mean, just think about what we have seen in our society over the last 50 years. I mean, it has been shocking. In fact, 2 Timothy 4, 3 says, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wandering off into myths. He's talking about the church. You go to Matthew chapter 4 and it says there's going to be a day when right is wrong and wrong is right. And we're going to begin to normalize sin. And we're going to begin to normalize what we want comfort to be. And we're going to continue to focus more and more and more on self. I mean, you just think of what is happening in, I mean, for, for children and Superman's son now is coming out as gay. The commercials, the movies, the sitcoms all are beginning to, to put in alternative lifestyles where it becomes normalized. Abortion running rampant and getting worse and worse and worse where you can abort a child eight, nine months when she is out of the womb trying to pass that through different states. And it's just the identity of who we are is being attacked. We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. We are children of God. Even the core of, of the foundation of the word of God is, is coming under attack. When, and, and from who? From the church. Not from the outside, but from the inside. And we are going to talk more about this in progressive Christianity next year. But, but even the cross is a memorial where Jesus' death, his resurrection, his second coming, as we take communion, it is being attacked. Again, I want to share with you is a book that, that we are going through, another gospel by Alicia Childress. And I want to quote what she says about how the cross is coming under attack. One of the memorials of the church in the New Testament and also alluded to Jesus' coming and his death and his resurrection in the Old Testament. Augustine of Hippo said, and I quote, but as Christ endured death as a man 
and for man, so also son of God as he was, ever living in his own righteousness, but dying for our offenses. He submitted as man and for man to bear the curse with accompanies, which accompanies death. And as he died in the flesh, which he took in bearing our punishment, so also while ever blessed in his own righteousness, he was cursed for our offenses in the death which he suffered in bearing our punishment. And now I want you to contrast that with Michael Gunger, who has wrote worship songs. He has now dove into to progressive Christianity, um, full throttle. He says this, I would love to hear more artists who sing to God and fewer who include a father murdering a son, speaking of God and then Jesus, murdering a son in that endeavor. I simply think blood sacrifice is a very hard, is a very limited and less than timely metaphor for what the cross can mean in our culture. That God needed to be appeased with blood is not beautiful, it's horrific. Which, which that goes against the very core of Christianity. The progressive view of the cross, and I quote, is that Jesus was killed by an angry mob for speaking truth to power. God didn't need his sacrifice, but in some way submitted it in order to set an example of forgiveness for all of us to follow. God didn't require blood, humans did. God did not kill Jesus, human culture and civilization did. God did not demand the death of Jesus, we did. And, 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 so, and so this idea that, that Jesus died to pay penalties for our sins is, is all over scripture. It is, it is the very core of Christianity. But as it is being distorted, as it is becoming another gospel where our children, our young people, adults are, are falling into this thinking, not only does it hurt the heart of God, it takes us away from the presence of God and what he has done in our lives so that our children might know who he is. And what he is about, what grace is all about, what justice is about, what love is all about. And so, so the question is, what kind of memorials are we setting in our home? What lessons are we creating for our children? You know, your relationship with each other is a memorial that we have to, to understand and that we have to treasure. Listen, our children will learn more about human relationships from the way that you and I relate to one another and that you relate to your spouse other than anything else. I mean, that's how important it's actually you're a memorial. We need to ask ourselves this question. What will our children remember of us? What will dominate their memory? Will they grow up remembering God as a part of our everyday life? How are they going to remember us? How are they going to remember our lives? Remember, are they going to remember us praying at home? Are they, are they going to remember times at the dinner table and what we talked about? Are they going to remember where we verbally talked about trusting in the Lord and making these decisions or that decisions? What about the communication that took place in the home? I remember of so many things in, in, in my childhood that, that my dad did, that my mother did. I mean, not per, no one's perfect. I'm not talking about perfection, but it's direction. This has to be important, and we need to write this down. Memorials educate the next generation. That's why I am so thankful for what God is doing and, and how he's leading us, what he's doing in this church. For us to be able to say, do you remember when God did this? Do you remember that? And to tell our children and to talk about things that we're going through and how God is stretching us and how God is molding us and how God has helped us cross the Jordan or is helping us to get where he desired us to go. I remember back when, when we were building this building and we got into a little uh, 
dispute with our contractors and we had to go through arbitration. And I was, I was sweating it and it was, hard, it was a hard time and we needed a miracle. And I was talking about it at home and talking about it at the dinner table. And I remember my little girl, Gabrielle, she, she, she said, Daddy, we're going to be praying. We're going to be praying for a miracle. And you know what she did? She baked cookies to raise money and made lemonade to raise money for us to help pay the, 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 the fees as, as the arbitration fees and everything that was going on at that time. I remember my son, Christian, we would talk about the missionaries we supported. We'd talk about his, his grandma and grandpa, his poppy and grammy of missionaries in Alaska and how we want to be a church who supports missionaries. And my son, when he was seven or eight, he wrote a book about catfish to sell to people. And he was going around selling it to people saying that we are going to give the money to the missionaries. I mean, these are, these are memorials. We don't realize how much when we begin to talk about God, how he spreads through our entire lives, including the people we are around. You'll be surprised at the impact that you'll make on your children. You'll be surprised at the impact that you'll make on your friends. You'll be surprised at the impact that you will make with your coworkers, with strangers. When we live and learn to be courageous, which leads us to the next thing. Third, we need to learn to be courageous. Why? Because memorials are evidence to the whole world that God is alive. Look at verse 23. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over. As the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over so that all the people of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. I mean, we're reading about it now. We're impacted by it now. I mean, in Joshua chapter 2, do you remember what Rahab said to the spies when they came in and saw her? Let me just bring back your memory of what Angela preached on. In Joshua 2 9 it says, and she said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melted away before you. For we have heard, watch this, we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is the God of the heavens above and the earth below. I mean, Rahab saying, hey, we have seen what God has done for you and it has made a memorial for us because we have seen it. We have heard it. That God is good, that God is great, that he is all powerful. It melted our hearts before we even met you. It is, it is reminding us, it was a memorial of who God was. And, and God said it to Joshua. You build this memorial and it will be a what? A sign to the people for all ages of God's power and ability. So memorials show other people of God's power in church. You are what brings this building to life. You are what brings River of Life alive. It's not just the banners that are on the outside. It's not just our guest cards that we want to pass out. It's not just when we do major events and we go through the neighborhoods and we put door hangers. That's all and good. But it's a sign to the people that God is doing something. But you and I breathe life into that. There's no life into the cards itself, into the banners itself. You, there is life in you, what God is doing in you and me. And God wants to establish memorials so people might see his glory. For some of us, it may be a memorial of our testimony. 
of, of something miraculous in our lives. For others of us, it's an example of, of, of how we treat our co-workers or what we say to, to them and they see something in, their, in our hearts that they can't put a finger on in our lives and they ask questions. In fact, all of us, our bodies are a memorial. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? Did you forget you were a memorial? Did you forget that your life counted? Did you forget that you mattered? Did you forget that you were a walking miracle? Did you forget you were a child of courage? You are a teenager of courage? You are a man of courage, a woman of courage? Did you forget who you are? You are not your own. He says, for you were bought with a price. There's the cross again in scripture. I died for you. I love you. I want to spend eternity with you. I want to work in your life as you are on this earth. You were bought with my blood. You were bought with my life, with my sacrifice. So glorify God, he says, in your body. Don't waste it. It's a treasure. Don't bury your life. It's a treasure. You are a treasure. I'm going to close with three, with a couple questions, with two questions. What is God doing in your life that is worth memorializing in your heart? So it becomes a part of you. Maybe through some written record or through an experience or a memory that is worth telling listen if you can't think of anything then maybe you need to evaluate and I need to evaluate our walk with God because God is always at work he is always speaking he is always moving us from glory to glory to glory he is, he is trying to get our attention. I believe the Lord is challenging the church of the living God to take that step of faith and cross over. And after that, to build a memorial for him and his provision so we can go back to it and say, we must remember who God is. We must remember what he has done. We must allow the word of God to be hidden in our hearts that, that we may not sin against him, but we can be a living, walking testimony of his love, his compassion, his mercy, who he is, what he wants to do. Second, what legacy are you leaving? What legacy are you leaving to your children? What legacy are you leaving to your friends? What legacy are you leaving to your co-workers? What legacy have you decided to leave to this world? Listen, I know for me, I want my children to remember that God was alive. That, that he was real to me. That yeah, I was not perfect, but I was active in my faith. I want them to see that so much that they act on it in their own life. I want them to know the value of prayer. I want them to know the value of self-control. I want them to know the value of joy. I want them to know that, that, listen, we must be proactive in building memorials in our lives for other people. We need to pass it on. We need to pass it on, especially to our family, to our children. It is critically important. Do they see a peace about you? Do they see a composure in a world of uncertainty right now? When everything is going out of control, you are in control because you have a God who is in charge and everyone sees it by your actions, by what comes out of your mouth. Listen, if people see God working in us, they will want to know that God. Just like Rahab did. We have heard about your God. We have seen God through you. I want to know about that. Church, 
God loves memorials. And the reason why is that memorials give him glory. They remind people just how great he really is. Amen? Listen, if you're here this morning and you're listening to my words and something's happening in your heart, it is God wanting you to start the greatest memorial that you can ever erect. And that is salvation. That is saying, you know, God, I am, I am nothing without you. I need you in my life. I am a sinner. And you know, we all fall short, the Bible says, of God's glory. But when we say, you know what? I believe Jesus Christ is God. I believe he is who he says he is. And I want to give my life to him. God, forgive me for my sins. Help me to become stronger and stronger in you. The Bible says you are changed. I am changed. We are a new creation in him. And if you've accepted Jesus this morning on our website, if you can go there, we have people that want to to, to connect with you. We want to not only pray with you, we want to get you involved in a, in a great church, depending on where you're at, whether it's in this city, whether it's in another state, wherever you are at, we want to come alongside of you. And if you need prayer for anything today, again, you go to our website and you just let us know, hey, Dale, can you pray for this? Can you pray for that? And we are going to come alongside of you because we do believe the Bible is true when it says we are to bear one another's burdens. Listen, God loves you. He is for you. I want you to continue to step out in faith. Be courageous. Allow him to work in your life and believe that he wants the best for you. God bless you. We will see you next week.